This is the iPhone 14 Plus. Hold it, I know, it's not. And yet, even if a lot of it does look like a phone we've yet to see, I think there's a far bigger story behind this particular product. See, making a phone is hard. It's easy to just sit here and criticize them, but those of us who have visited factories and seen the difficulties of the craft have learned to appreciate all the effort there is behind turning ideas into products, and especially because not all of them succeed. The market is so cutthroat that it doesn't even matter how large your company is, RIP, LG, and HTC. And yet, wanna know what's even harder? To make a good phone. We've always said that Three is the magic number for a product to go from just okay to really good. It wasn't until the iPhone 3GS, Galaxy S3, and OnePlus 3 that we saw the implementation of those ideas walk the talk, and even then, ideals were still missing. It wasn't until the iPhone 4, Galaxy Note 4, OnePlus 10 Pro that we saw good cameras, for example. I give you all this introduction to provide context for how difficult it was for some of the best companies to get it right. So it's kind of baffling to me to sit here and tell you that a new startup with less than, what, 50 people in two offices in London has pretty much nailed most of that struggle on the first try. This is the Nothing Phone 1, what the company calls as pure instinct, and what I'm gonna call one of the most interesting shockers of 2022. Whether you agree or disagree with their marketing, it's hard to deny how impressive it is for this phone to be all it is, cost so little, and all in generation one. I'm Jaime Rivera with Pocket Now, and this is our full review. Nothing claims that phones have gotten boring, but you and I have heard that before. LG, HTC, and many others have used these same exact words before, all while launching yet another flat slab as their solution. Surely, I do feel that the premise is not entirely wrong, but only Samsung and a few others have actually launched something truly different. As smartphones have matured, it's natural for companies to simplify and mass produce the most practical solutions, and as the Toyota Camry and Ford F-150 can attest, this is because the products that sell most are not necessarily the most exciting, if we're gonna call them that. The Nothing Phone 1 is a very interesting animal because even if it is a conventional phone, it draws a lot of the nostalgia that's pretty trendy right now. It doesn't fold, flip, or roll out, but it does use a completely different approach to its flat real estate. This transparent back feels like a nod to Apple's translucent iMac. The company's font reminds me of the dot matrix printers we grew up with, and even the packaging looks like something you can buy at an Urban Outfitters. But like seriously, at a time when Dua Lipa, The Weeknd, and Stranger Things are making the 80s cool again, this phone is like a modern homage to the past. Yes, I know you're going to call it out, so let me just say it, it does match the iPhone 13 Pro Max so well that I'm sure comparisons will be made to the new models that are coming soon. As such, Phone 1 does fall a victim of Apple's excessive minimalism, right down to the lack of a charger in the box, but at the same time, compensates with Cupertino's sense of elegance, at a price you'd barely find the five-year-old design of the iPhone SE. Seriously, have a look at what the market looks like in this price bracket and notice how there's really no other competitor that looks or feels this good. From the matte aluminum rails to the flat finish of the Gorilla Glass 3 on both sides, it does enough of a job at turning heads from a distance, but takes it further once you see this back up close. We knew they were going transparent, but instead of a tasteless display of wires, coils, and a battery, nothing used the mesh of recycled plastics in order to decorate the back in a way we've really never seen before. There's so much attention to detail and taste that you'll even notice an elephant drawn in the bottom if you look closely. You'd think that would be enough, but then there's an extra 900 plus LEDs here that all combine to form the glyph, or glyphs if you'd like to call them that. Glyph is a term used in 
typography, architecture to designate any kind of purposeful mark, but your guess is as good as mine as to what the symbol means, though its existence is intentional. When I first saw it, I had this full-blown Ratatouille moment as this whole idea dragged me to the past the light of my old Motorola V600, and how its rings would light up in different colors based on whatever contact categories I had created. Just like that 20-year-old phone, you can set different ringtones, which in turn defines different behaviors and combos for the LEDs, and since only you know what each of them means, it intends to make the experience more intimate. Sadly, it seems that two decades haven't made this experience any more granular as a lot of the functionality is pretty limited. Aside from specific contacts you assign certain ringtones to, and sure, certain applications, it won't let you go deeper within apps for extra behavior. The charging battery meter is pretty cool, and having it light up completely for night video is too, but that's it. Surely, the ideal is for you to place your phone face down in order to only react to what you care about, but my stigma over micro scratches on the display killed that idea pretty quick, and it's not like if I can't selectively control what to get bothered by today on my smartwatch. Still, it is as unique as having a display of this quality at such a low price range. The flexible OLED used here is pretty high-end and responsible for a lot of the key experiences. It's the reason why this is probably the only mid-ranger you'll see with symmetrical bezels, high refresh rate up to 120Hz, and pretty awesome color reproduction and viewing angles. At 6.55 inches diagonal and 1080p resolution, pixel density is pretty good, and that also means this is not a small phone at all, so the Experience consuming content is as good as you'd expect from more expensive devices, even if the dual firing speakers aren't necessarily as balanced as I'd like if you muffle the bottom module. Change the fact that there is so much wasted space here. Speaking of unique, there are some elements about Nothing OS that follow this same mentality. I love little things like the dot matrix font on the always on display and the fact that this is one of only a few Android phones that doesn't show me notifications on the lock screen unless my face is detected. You'll notice some minor subtleties like some larger control icons, the company's retro style ringtones, and your choice of four unique wallpapers, which actually doubled since I began this review. The only problem is that the list ends there. I do wish there were more than just four dot matrix widgets and additional elements to help this launcher stand out. So far, aside from the retro style voice recorder app and the NFT widget my Twitter poll just proved you won't care about, that's it. Now, in its defense, if there is one thing I praise is that it mimics the Google Pixel launcher better than others. From the lack of bloatware to the animated reaction to buttons or a charge, plus the fact that the non-removable search bar is adequately placed, at least this version of Material U offers some of the flexibility we wish Google did not neglect from its own phones. Now, over the past week or so that I've been using this device, I will admit I wasn't expecting much given just how new nothing is, and yet the experience has been mostly positive. I did run into a couple of bugs three days in, but which mostly got ironed out on version 1.02 that launched on the retail units. So far, the user interface has been pretty snappy, almost bare bones in its lack of animations within the home screen, launching applications, and even how quickly it unlocks with the on-screen fingerprint scanner. Clearly, the Snapdragon 778G Plus handles day-to-day -day tasks better than most mid-range and this is while testing the entry-level 8 gigs of RAM variant. Other elements from the spec sheet also exceed expectations for the price from the IP rating to the fast and reverse wireless charging options, the complete dual SIM 5G package, Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2, you name it. About the only thing I wish was better tuned is endurance because even if this phone ends the day on a charge, you will notice it drains the battery quicker than other comparable phones that I've tested. I think it's not until you get into camera performance that you start noticing that there's one thing where you get what you pay for. The company made a big deal about how they'd rather give us two good cameras than three or four mediocre ones, but the spec sheet and the results don't really reflect that in at least half the cases. 
The photos are what I'd call pretty good for the price so long as you're using the primary sensor. You'll notice colors are pretty inconsistent with the ultra wide going a bit more flat while the primary sensor pushes the saturation that my eyes were seeing in the moment. Naturally, since the primary is doing the legwork for the 2X, those colors remain the same as it crops in. But since this is a crop and not a change in focal length, I wouldn't use them for street photography either. Getting close-ups of flowers or items does a pretty good job in shallow depth of field, even if the bokeh does tend to drift to a natural territory. Now, where I was impressed is with the night mode, though, which is usually the pain point of mid-rangers. You'll see this camera is able to pull out a ton of detail with both sensors, up to the point where most of the photos I took are comparable to even flagships that are twice as expensive, but just don't push it too hard. As for selfies, I wouldn't say they're necessarily as good in the dark as they are during the day for obvious reasons, and it's a matter of taste if you like nothing's over sharpening on skin tones. I do think standard portraits do a far better job, and that's par for the course since you're using better optics. When we get to video, sadly, things just start to fall apart. At a time when social media video is so important, it overdoes one thing and undercooks the other. The primary cameras are capable of some nice stabilization and dynamic range, but once you pull these clips into a computer, you'll notice the colors are completely unnatural. You guessed it. They're filmed in Rec 2020, which you can't disable in the settings. Seems Carl Pei brought that pain point back from OnePlus, which surely is a more advanced color space, but completely unnecessary and overly complicated to use for the average consumer this phone is targeting. And then selfie video goes completely under with absolutely zero stabilization and pretty flat colors. Listen, I'll forgive the 1080p resolution for the price, but this is definitely not not a phone that I use for Instagram Reels, Stories, or TikTok. To conclude, I think it's important to be honest with ourselves and ask a question. Is the phone one any less boring than other phones? And the quick answer is yes, but so long as you stick within its mid-range category. Obviously, for the price of three of these, you can get phones that flip and fold, which aren't boring at all, but of course, they shouldn't be. If you were to look into this bracket in a vacuum, as you should, then it's pretty clear that nothing's formula is of much better value than almost anything it competes with. And sure, I know that it doesn't really walk the talk in most of its marketing. Nothing promised this amazing ecosystem of products that talk to each other, and aside from the ear ones connecting to it as quick as they do with any other phone, and a Tesla application that still doesn't work, that's about it. Same thing with promising two cameras that do better than three or four, and they're just really okay. I consider at least the photos to be acceptable for the price, but try to convince a teenager or a young adult that video quality is secondary. Bottom line, if we were to ignore some of those promises and judge this phone as a whole, the Nothing Phone 1 is still a really good product. From the unique hardware to the tuned up software, I do feel you're getting a pretty good value, even if the camera is there to remind you that this is a mid-ranger. It's not the perfect phone, nor does it distract me less, nor does it bring me back to me as the marketing promises, but again, this is phone number one. I don't think I've ever seen any other company launch a more refined product on the first try, and yet nothing pretty much did. To that, I say bravo. If you're in the market for a pretty good looking mid-ranger you won't feel ashamed to show off, this should be your phone. But that is, of course, if you're in a region that sells it. The United States is not one of them. Let us know what you think about the Nothing Phone 1 in the comments down below, and while you're at it, follow us on social media and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this one. You can also follow me on my personal handles to see me debate the name of this company, but like its products because I'm pretty impressed. Please give this video a thumbs up if you like what you saw. I'm Jaime Rivera. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you on the next one.